Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 223, Self-Evident Truths Relevant to Trinity or Incarnation Theories, Part 2. In this episode of the Trinity's podcast, I'm going to discuss a number of propositions which I think Reed would call first principles. These are truths which any human can know, so long as they have the relevant sort of experiences. These are beliefs that a human will automatically form in certain situations when they're thinking about a certain topic or perceiving certain things. Any human will form these beliefs and know them unless some non-rational factor interferes. I've divided these into truths which are relevant to various types of Trinity and Incarnation theories, and on the blog post for this episode, I'll have all of these many principles written out, so you might want to look at that list later or even while you're listening to the podcast. So just find the blog post for podcast 223 at trinities.org. The first group of them has to do with Trinity theories, which are based on the concept of relative identity. Relative identity is the idea that things could be the same something or other and yet different something else's. It's a very difficult idea. It's an idea that most philosophers reject. And it's an idea I think that most people just do not have. It was first come up with, arguably, because of Trinity theories. If you want more detail on what these theories are, you can look at my entry called Trinity in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Just Google Trinity Stanford. Perhaps the best developed such theory is by philosophers Michael Ray and Jeffrey Brower. In another publication, I've called that Constitution Trinitarianism because there's an idea that just as a physical object is constituted by some portion of matter, so the persons of the Trinity are all constituted by one portion of not matter, but divine stuff, divine nature. But now nature is something that can enter into what they call constitution relations. That's one of a number of suggestions that the Trinity should be understood to involve relative identity. If relative identity metaphysicians are right, then you can't ask whether or not things are identical, just numerically identical, full stop, You have to always supply some kind. Are they the same this? Are they the same that? And again, they suppose that things might be the same something and yet count as two different examples of something else. So the first self-evident truth that's relevant to such theories is in my numbering, number 21. It says, if every F is a G, then there are at least as many G's as F's. So that's a little bit abstract, F and G here are just supposed to be certain types of things. Again, if every F is a G, there have to be at least as many G's as F's. I think it becomes more obvious when you just consider a concrete instance of it, such as this. If every child here is a member of the Smith family, there are at least as many members of the Smith family as there are children here. Another example. If every dandelion in the yard is a weed in the yard, then there are at least as many weeds in the yard as there are dandelions in the yard. Seems obvious, doesn't it? Well, so does this. If every divine person is a god, there are at least as many gods as there are divine persons. Now, a relative identity theorist denies that. And so, a relative identity theorist is denying that if every F is a G, there are at least as many G's as F's. Yeah, but that seems self-evident. So much the worse for those sorts of theories. Now, notice that those are Trinity theories which say that every divine person by himself is a god. They don't all say that, of course, Some Trinity theories deny that each divine person is a god. 
So the Trinity theory propounded by Christian philosopher and apologist William Lane Craig, on that theory, only the Trinity is a God and the Father is not a God. Well, he's got a problem with the New Testament there, doesn't he? But my point is that his Trinity theory doesn't run afoul of this Principle 21. But theories propounded by people like Peter Van Inwagen and Mike Ray, they do run afoul of it. Principle 22. To be a God is to be a certain individual, concrete being or entity. Now some people and some philosophers think that every real being is a concrete being. Concrete here is opposed to abstract By definition, concrete beings can enter into causal relationships, and by definition, abstract objects can't do that. Are there any abstract objects? A lot of philosophers have thought so. Things like universal properties, relations, individual essences, even fictional characters sometimes have been thought of as abstract objects. But their existence is and always has been controversial. There have always been some philosophers who thought that you don't need to believe in such things as abstract objects or abstracta. Okay, but the concept of a deity is the concept of a certain sort of great self, and this entails that it can do things, and even that it can be a cause of events in the world, at least potentially. All right, but then the concept of a deity rules out that a deity is an abstract object, such as a universal property or a relation, or even an inconceivable something or other. If you start gassing about some ultimate reality that's utterly inconceivable, okay, well then the concept of a concrete or an individual being wouldn't apply to it, and it wouldn't be one of those. Yeah, but that doesn't seem right if we're talking about a god or a deity, such as the one called God in the Bible. And you don't want to make the mistake of thinking that God just is the divine nature. Now, nature can mean being, so sometimes when philosophers call God the divine nature, they mean just that God is a divine being. Well, that seems right. That's what a God is supposed to be. But if a divine nature is supposed to be just a defining essence, which is a certain type of either universal or individual property, then no, then you're back to an abstract object, and it seems like A God isn't supposed to be one of those. Okay, so to be a God is to be a certain individual, concrete being or entity. Number 23, being the same God requires being the same individual, concrete being or entity. To me, 22 and 23 are closely related, but it's 23, I think, that really cuts against relative identity trinity theories. For those relative identity theories, you can have beings that are not numerically identical, and yet, for instance, Ray says they are to be counted as one, or to be counted as one God. What? Why do we have to notice that these two things are different and then turn around and say that they're the same certain sort of thing, such as the same God? That doesn't make sense, because a God just is a certain being, so being the same God requires being the same being. I think the absurdity of the relative identity Trinitarian's suggestion that things can be numerically different, that is non-identical beings, and yet that they are to be counted as the same God, I think that comes out when you consider certain hypothetical scenarios. So take the God of Israel. Probably most of the listeners of the podcast believe in this God. We think this is God, the real God. The God of Israel, we believe, is the creator of the cosmos. So now we find out about some newly discovered tribe of people, call them the Picanosians, and the alleged god of the Picanosians, just by definition, is not the creator of the cosmos. Okay? Now, we're probably going to think that this being is just a being of fiction. That there is no deity, there is no god of the Picanosians. But, here's something that we should all agree about. Since God is the creator, and this alleged deity of the Picanosians is not the creator, then, if this being that they're talking about is a real being, well, anyway, it's not God. It's not identical to God. It's not numerically identical to God. 
God created this being, again, granting that it's real, this being did not create. Okay, so we're talking about non-identical beings, right? We talked about this last time. Things which at the same time differ are two beings. A thing can't be and not be the same way at the same time. Okay, so it's obvious that if this alleged being exists, well, it's not going to be the same being as the God who created, right? Because we're just stipulating that this God of the Pycnosians is not the creator. Okay, now in this kind of scenario, would you come along then and say, yeah, okay, they're not identical, but are they the same God or not? Gee, I'm still wondering that. No, that, that's an absurd question. They're not the same being. They're not the same God. They're not the same anything. Let me give a less fanciful example. So suppose that you say, by Allah, I mean the being who sent Muhammad as the last and greatest prophet. Suppose you say, well, that's what I mean by Allah. It's the being who did that, sent Muhammad. Allah, basically, you could replace it with the sender of Muhammad, okay? And now by God, you mean the one Jesus calls Father. So you're trying to take a New Testament view of God, and by Allah, you're going to mean very specifically the being who sent Muhammad. Now, once we add in that we think God did not send Muhammad, we Christians think that, right? Okay, so if there is an Allah, if there is a being who sent Muhammad, well, we think God did not send Muhammad, and so, this being, Allah, must be a different being than God. Why? Because they have differed. We think that one did a certain action, and at the same time, this other one, God, didn't do that action. Okay. Again, it's just the distinctness of discernibles. We think we detect a difference in these two beings, and so, granting that there is a being that sent Muhammad, we think that's not God. If someone comes along and says, yeah, okay, I grant that God and Allah are not numerically identical. Yeah, but are they the same God? I'm still wondering that. No, that's, that's an absurd question, right? There is no further question to wonder about there. If they're not the same being, they can't be the same God. Sorry, this is just common sense. Now, I know it conflicts with certain metaphysical speculations, but, you know... That's the worst for those speculations. I don't think anyone, even devotees of that sort of trinity theory, in my two situations that I've described, would be sitting there wondering, yeah, but is that the same God or not? I think that shows you that this is a principle of common sense. It is something that's self-evident normally. It is obvious that being the same God requires being the same being. 24. If X is the God of Y, then X and Y are not the same God. If X is the God of Y, then X and Y are not the same God. Or, I think you could put the same point like this, no God is the God over himself. Or, God of is a non-reflexive relation. That's a really abstract way of putting it. But I think those all are making the same claim. Let's just stick with, if X is the God of Y, then X and Y are not the same God. This, I think, points out the incompatibility of the New Testament with any relative identity approach to the Trinity. On those relative identity approaches to the Trinity, the Father and the Son are the same God. And yet, the New Testament repeatedly and explicitly says that the Father is the God of the Son. Okay, if the Father is the God of the Son, then they're not the same God. No God is God over himself. That's just nonsense, right? Sorry, relative identity theories. The New Testament does say this. References are in the blog post for this episode. And this principle does seem self-evident. This principle is not something that's in the New Testament, but this isn't the kind of principle that a writer would feel the need to go around saying. It's just true by definition. It's just obvious. So that's why it's not there. It doesn't need to be said. But it's a piece of common sense that you are to bring to the texts. And so when you see that the Father is the Son's God, that tells you that they're not the same God. 
This seems to refute relative identity trinity theories, so long as you grant that the New Testament should trump later Catholic traditions like the Athanasian Creed when the two should clash. And, you know, I think any Protestant should take that view. With Catholics and Eastern Orthodox believers, the discussion is more complicated. It's in fact a lot easier to base the Trinity on later Catholic traditions, and you can just bypass this whole issue of its fit with the New Testament. But you do still, I think, have to worry about conflicts, because even Roman Catholics sometimes, I think, want to correct later traditions by the New Testament. Sometimes they want to do that. And I say, bravo. When the Trinity's podcast returns, four self-evident truths relevant to defenses of Trinity and Incarnation theories as mysteries. Mystery defenses, as I've discussed in a number of publications, basically take two forms, and sometimes people will even combine them. One sort of mystery defense is to say that some trinity theory or some idea about the incarnation is an apparent contradiction, and then go on to argue that that's okay. We should expect apparent contradictions in theology because these matters are so far beyond us that we're just constantly going to run into what look like contradictions. But of course, we know that not every apparent contradiction is a real contradiction, so we should just take them as merely apparent, and nothing's wrong with that, right? Another type of mystery defense is where you just heavily smudge any meaning or interpretation given to the Trinity language, and you're defending them not in the face of being apparently contradictory, but you've sucked so much meaning out of them that it doesn't even look like they can be apparently contradictory. You're defending them as mysteries in the sense of dark sayings that at most can barely at all be understood. So principle 25 is one of the biggest problems with what I've called positive mysterianism, which is defending theological claims as believable apparent contradictions. 25 says, apparent incoherence is strong evidence of falsehood. Apparent incoherence means that the thing seems self-contradictory. Either these set of claims include what look like a P and a not P, or they include a P and a Q, and it seems obvious that if P, then not Q. So that's not part of the theory, but it's just part of common sense that we bring to it. Anyway, it looks like you can just fairly easily deduce a contradiction from the view. The problem with this is, usually, in just about all circumstances, we take apparent incoherence as strong evidence of falsehood. Now, it can be overturned but it takes a lot to overturn it. And a problem that comes up over and over again is that apparent incoherence is such strong evidence for falsehood that it's hard to see how there's going to be more evidence in favor of the truth of these claims. I discussed this in some detail in a published paper of mine called On Positive Mysterianism, so you can Google a copy of that if you want to hear more about that. Now, about apparent incoherence, some people just say, well, one man's nonsense is another man's metaphysical profundity. Yes, that's true in a sense, but, you know, these things are not merely matters of taste or opinion. If there is such a thing as common sense, as our God-given ability to know certain truths without reasoning our way to them, or even without being able to argue for them, then that's a kind of foundational part of our rational abilities And moreover, it ought to be the same in all people. Of course, it's not quite the same because people's judgments are somewhat warped by non-rational factors. So not all difficulties are alike. Apparent incoherence is a pretty bad difficulty, especially when 
it sticks around when you really carefully look into it and try to get clear about the meaning of the theory and try to resolve misunderstandings of it. And at the end of the day, you still just have this apparent incoherence. Number 26 has to do with negative mysterianism and points out a really serious shortcoming of it, which is sentences which can't be understood can't be believed. This, I take it, is really a point about psychology. We all understand intuitively what belief is. To believe is to commit to reality being a certain way. Now, if someone says a sentence to you, say, in a foreign language, and you don't speak that foreign language, and all you just perceive are the sounds, you can't believe whatever it was that they said. You can nod at the sentence, you can salute it, You can take a recording of it and someone says, what do you believe? You could play back the recording, but you actually can't get your mind into the right position because you don't know what was said. If you're supposed to commit to reality being a certain way and believing it, what way? What what are we talking about? Now, understanding comes in degrees and you can sort of completely understand the meaning of a certain sentence or set of sentences, or you can sort of grasp a little of it, but not a lot of the other elements of it, and so on. And when it comes to the Trinity, I think people know what they're supposed to say, and then they have some vague mental images of what it all really amounts to. So think of the various artistic depictions that you have seen of the Trinity. So you've got three guys who look the same, they're all wearing crowns, they're sitting on three different thrones or you've got one head with three faces on it, or you've got one body with three heads coming off it, or maybe you've got a pie cut into three parts and things like this. I think for a lot of Trinitarians, they just don't have any developed Trinity theory. They're sure that there's something really important and profound and true there, and they've been told that this is essential in some sense to Christianity. Their allegiance is definitely to the words and to these vague ideas. And what beliefs they actually have shift around quite a lot and are really unsettled because they don't have just one image and different images suggest different things. So when I talk to just an ordinary believer, I remember talking to a friend of mine who was a Pentecostal from a theoretically Trinitarian denomination. And in conversation with her, just, you know, asking a few questions, she would say that the Trinity are three parts of God. And then if that was pushed on a little bit, no, maybe it's three personalities of God. Well, maybe it's three beings, each of which is a God. Yeah, she just didn't have any Trinity theory. She was committed to, you know, words like God is triune, but she didn't have any really specific meaning that she would attach to those words. She thought that God is triple somehow, and that was about it. Okay, so to the degree that we just say these words are mysterious and really can't be understood in this life, then to that same degree, these things are not believable. But wait a second, I thought these were supposed to be important beliefs, beliefs that we base our life on, beliefs that are important to all the other areas in theology, and even important in how we live our lives and how we worship God. It seems like if some Trinitarian theology is true, then it should be something important and something that we should believe. This has always been the official view, right? 28, and this one is going back to positive Mysterian views on which things like the Trinity should be accepted, even though they are apparently incoherent. 28 says, For any serious written source, charity requires that we try hard to avoid seemingly incoherent interpretations. This is how you want people to read your letters or your memoirs if you write them. This is how people obviously should read any modern history book. This is obviously how people should read the Gospels. Now, sometimes people may write something just joshing around, just having a good time, and they might make it pretty contradictory, you know, have some Lewis Carroll type fun with it. And then this doesn't apply because maybe it's just being contradictory for the heck of it. But for any serious source, which is urging certain things as true, which is trying to make certain assertions, it looks like we should assume that 
it all can be worked out, that it doesn't contradict itself in any way. And if it does seem to contradict itself, well, maybe in the end we'll have to say that it contradicts itself, but it looks like to take it seriously, to exercise charity toward the author, we should see if it can be interpreted in a seemingly coherent way. In my view, this is the Achilles heel of positive Mysterian defenses of Trinity and Incarnation theories. In all cases I'm aware of, the paradoxical, that is, seemingly incoherent, seemingly self-contradictory interpretations of the New Testament texts that bear directly on Christology or on the Trinity, in all cases I'm aware of, those texts have better, coherent, rival interpretations. And so why on earth would you just rush past those and jump for the incoherent interpretation? It's uncharitable. In reading just about any other book, it would be called out as a mistake of interpretation. A really obvious example of the kind of thing I'm talking about is in the 2007 book by Robert M. Bowman Jr. and J. Ed Komaszewski called Putting Jesus in His Place, The Case for the Deity of Christ. Toward the beginning of the book, on page 21, they tell you that they think that according to the New Testament, the Son is God. That is, the Son just is God himself. They are numerically identical. Oh, and by the way, also according to the New Testament, they're distinct. They're not numerically identical. Excuse me? Are they that confused? They say that the New Testament identifies Jesus as God. And then they add, We take for granted that Jesus is not God the Father. Rather, Jesus is the Son of the Father. 2 John 3 NASB. The New Testament makes a distinction between the two, sometimes as the Father and the Son, and sometimes as God and the Son of God. Although it's hard to understand, watch out, here it comes, the New Testament both distinguishes Jesus from God and identifies him as God, sometimes in the same breath. For example, John 1.1, 1, 1, John 20.28-31, 20, Hebrews 1.8-9, 1, and 9, 2 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2. It is this fact about New Testament teaching, paralleled in what it also teaches about the Holy Spirit, that led Christian theologians to formulate the doctrine of the Trinity. We will not be discussing the Trinity in this book, although Jesus' identity as God is a key part of that doctrine. Now, that last part is not really true. I mean, this view that the New Testament is apparently incoherent really doesn't come up in the early discussions. The actual story is a lot longer, and I won't go into it. But my main point is that they are foisting a ridiculous confusion onto the New Testament, and on specifically to texts like the Gospel according to John and the letter to the Hebrews. Those books don't confuse Jesus with God. They don't identify Jesus and God and also distinguish Jesus from God. Why should that confused interpretation survive more than a first pass? When the Trinity's podcast returns, some self-evident truths relevant to critical thinking about incarnation theories. The first three principles I'm going to discuss now rule out traditional incarnation theories given one assumption. This is the assumption that the eternal Logos is the one self within the incarnate Christ. Put differently, in the incarnation, the man Jesus is the same self as the eternal divine Logos. Again, the incarnation I'm now assuming involves the eternal Logos, a divine self, entering into a mysterious union with a complete human nature, body and soul. And because of that mysterious union, that soul involved is not the self of Jesus. Rather, the Logos is the self in that man. 
This assumption can be denied. Some would say that this is a misinterpretation of the classical incarnation speculations from the 4th, 5th, 6th centuries, and this assumption has been denied by some within the small c Catholic traditions. So this is how many, possibly most, thinkers now understand those Catholic traditions. Principle 29. If X is an ancestor of Y, then there was a time when X existed and Y did not. Or, if you like, if Y is a descendant of X, then there is a time when X existed and Y did not. This is a principle of common sense, isn't it? If we find out that George Washington is an ancestor of a certain person, then we infer from that that George Washington existed before that other person did. I know that this Principle 29 is contradicted by Eastern views about reincarnation, and for that matter, ancient Greek views about reincarnation or transmigration of souls. But, you know, theories like that are against common sense. Relatedly, Principle 30, if X is an ancestor of Y, then X is a direct or indirect cause of the existence of Y. We think of the parents as co-causes of their offspring. Of course, there is a whole chain of causes in your lineage. Your grandpa is in your lineage, and he's an indirect cause of your existence. The direct cause, again, being your parents. Anyone who's in that cause and effect chain is part of your lineage. They're one of your ancestors. Again, relatedly, 31, a human being is within the human lineage and must therefore be either a first human or one that exists because of the causal actions of one or more previous humans. Mere human type present qualities are not enough. A human being is a being within the human lineage. You can picture it all like a tree. There's the trunk, there's the large branches, there's the small branches, and the higher parts exist because of the lower parts, and any genuine human is a part of that structure. So the human race should be thought of like a big family tree on which you can locate any human. Now why would you think that mere human type present qualities are not enough? Well, suppose that we scanned your DNA, and in a lab we made a living being which looks and acts like a human, and has the sort of DNA that an offspring produced by you and your wife would produce. This being, call him newbie, is not, thereby, your son. The qualitative similarity he has to an offspring of yours is not enough, right? He's not your son, nor is he a member of your extended family or your nuclear family. Why? He's not in that specific lineage. He's not in the lineage of your family. But neither is he in the lineage of the human family. This is obvious, right? The New Testament explicitly teaches the man Jesus to have had a mother. This implies that she is a cause of his existing and that there was a time when she existed, but he did not. Again, the New Testament explicitly teaches that Jesus is a descendant of David, the ancient Israelite king. Then, we should infer that these authors think that David existed before Jesus did. But if that's true, then incarnation theories are false. If the man Jesus is the same self as the eternal Logos, and so is the same being as the eternal Logos, then it's false that he is within the human lineage. He's not in that lineage. He would have existed whether or not there were ever any humans, and he existed long before there were any humans at all. That puts him outside the lineage, but that means he's not a real human being. At most, this Logos with a human soul and body would look like a human being. The Logos would be mysteriously combined with parts which would be qualitatively like the parts that make up a human being, assuming that dualism is true. But anyway, he'd be like a simulation of a human being. When you saw him, when you shook his hand, when you had a conversation with him, you would infer that he was part of the human lineage, but he wouldn't be because he would have existed, again, whether or not there were any humans. He, this Logos, which is the same self, which is the incarnate Christ. 
having all the right components just isn't enough. Suppose there was this beloved gorilla in a zoo, and suppose that dualism is true, and people love this gorilla so much that when the gorilla's body started to fail, I don't know, it has kidney disease or something, then they figure out how to separate the soul and body. And not only that, but they take that gorilla soul and they can put it into a hypostatic union with a human body and a soul. So that human body and soul don't compose a human because of the hypostatic union. But the gorilla soul is the one self in the resulting being. Now, that doesn't make that gorilla or that gorilla soul a man, right? It'd just be seemingly a gorilla that looks like a man. Again, suppose that a demon could not only possess you, but could take over in a stronger sense. So a demon not only comes into you and temporarily takes over your body and your voice, but he sort of deactivates your soul. Okay, but your soul is still there. Your soul is still combined with your body somehow, but he inhabits that body now, and he is the self within that body. Your soul isn't doing anything. It's not even conscious. It's not acting, it's not thinking, nothing. But it's there, okay? It's like deactivated. It's like the batteries have been taken out of it. Now, in a circumstance like that, this would not be a living human being, right? The demon plus those human components would not constitute a man. You'd have a demon puppeting human components, and he wouldn't be in the lineage, even though somehow these components may have been derived from the human race. The components coming from the human race is one thing, but the self that we're talking about is not something that exists within that lineage. Now, I've got some other principles that are trouble for various incarnation theories, but these are theories that do not have the Logos as the one self within Christ. Not all incarnation theories say that, and some of them don't feature a human soul in the incarnate Christ because the worry is that that would involve too many selves. If a soul is by definition a self, and you don't want to have two Jesuses in there, then you just want to basically replace the soul with the logos. So some theories go that way. On the other hand, for some incarnation theories, each of the natures, the human nature and the divine nature, is a self, a thing which thinks which can communicate, which can experience, and so on. And those, I think, run up against principle 32. As depicted in the New Testament, Jesus is a single self. This is a case just of basic reading comprehension. You find this Jesus character very prominent in the New Testament, especially in the first four books in the Gospels. And Jesus, that word, that name, does not denote a pair of selves or really any more than one. It's just the name of a man, very special and unique man to be sure. Maybe you think it's a God man, but anyway, Jesus in the New Testament is a single self. As my friend Dr. Tim Paul, the Roman Catholic analytic theologian, points out, a lot of these guys in the 300s and the 400s and the 500s and the 600s and the 700s and the 800s, a lot of these Catholic thinkers thought that each of the natures was a being and moreover the sort of being which can think and act and know and choose. And so they have two selves in the incarnate Christ. And I think those theories are ruled out by this principle of common sense. This is a truth I claim that anyone can know just through simple reading comprehension, just by simply reading the New Testament. Principle 33. Mere control of a human body is not enough to make a self human. Just because some being is embodied and that body is the type of body that a human has, even if that body is one that came from a human so that it was produced as a part of the human lineage, yeah, just being in control of that doesn't make you a human. And I think that's pretty well illustrated by my imaginary demon possession case where the demon can take over your body. Now, in that case, I had him just deactivate your soul but keep it. But suppose a demon could actually just kick out your soul so your soul's now flowing around free or imagine a demon could even destroy your soul. And so just the demon is left fully in charge, unrivaled of your body. 
Well, that would make him a man, right? Again, imagine that you could just perform a soul swap with an animal, such as a gorilla. You're looking at a gorilla at the zoo. You say, oh, you poor guy, you look so unhappy. I would give anything to trade places with you. And God says, you've got it, ma'am. And boom, he puts your soul in the gorilla, and then he puts the gorilla's soul in your body, and hilarity ensues. There's got to be a good movie plot here, or maybe a bad movie plot. But anyway, that would not result in your becoming a gorilla. Not really. Although you'd look like one, it wouldn't result in the gorilla becoming a woman. Now, historically, and modern times, and also in ancient times, some people who accepted the two natures theory had the human nature just being a human body and the divine nature being the logos. And so this has been described and sort of ridiculed by some current day theologians as the view that the incarnation is God in a bod. But look, this is what people like Athanasius seem to think. They seem to think, in short, that the logos took the place of a human soul in Jesus but the problem with that is it looks like that's going to result in a pseudo-human because mere control of a human body is not enough to make a self human. That logos, and again, that logos is not within the human lineage. That's supposed to be the one self that is Jesus. Proposition 34, whatever is conscious knows, intentionally acts, and is praiseworthy or blameworthy for those acts is a self. Some people think that in the life of Jesus, sometimes it was one nature talking, sometimes it was another nature talking, sometimes it was one nature acting, such as being worried or scared, and sometimes it was another nature acting, such as producing a miracle. Okay, but if they're both doing things, they're both performing intentional actions, then both of them are selves. And then what looks like one self really is two selves somehow intimately joined, kind of like Siamese twins, but one of them, the man, in a sense, can be seen, and another one, the divine nature, can't be seen. So I think this principle 34 really makes problems for what is arguably the original interpretation of that two natures talk. When the Trinity's podcast returns, our remaining self-evident truths these ones are relevant to the, quote, deity of Christ, or to just people who confuse Jesus with God. Number 35 is that God can authorize a human to do what otherwise only God would have the right to do. This seems really obvious because God is supposed to be omnipotent, or at least if you like, he's supposed to far exceed us in power. And for us, this sort of delegation is easy. So say you owe me a debt, you owe me $10,000, and I'm feeling generous but I'm also feeling lazy, so I don't go to collect the debt myself. I hire a debt collector. I hire an agent. But I tell this agent, because I'm in a forgiving mood, that if you are humble, if you ask nicely, if you have a good sob story about why you can't pay me the $10,000 back, then you can forgive him. And, you know, if he's going to be a snot about it, then just say, nope, it's due tomorrow. What? But I'm the owner of the debt. How can anybody other than me let someone off of that debt? Well, what do you mean, how can anybody other than me do it? I just said, how? I get you in my office and I say, that's the deal. If you want, you can forgive them. I'm going to give you some general conditions that they should meet, but I'm going to leave the determination up to you. Okay, so then someone could forgive a debt on my behalf, a debt that's owed to me. One judge might appoint another judge 
to judge on his behalf. Certainly, we know that an ambassador has the ability to speak for a leader. So say if a president sends a special ambassador to the leader of another country, it can be that what that ambassador says was indirectly said by the sender. So if Trump wants to tell Putin, stop interfering in Syria, or we're going to nuke your troops, then the ambassador goes and says those words that the president of the United States says, thus saith Trump, stop interfering in Syria, or we're going to nuke your troops, then it is true to say that Trump has indirectly told Putin to stop. Trump has made a threat indirectly through the ambassador. Now, can just anybody do that? Can I go into Putin's office, assuming I can even get there? Can I just go up to Putin and deliver this message? Of course I can't. I haven't been delegated to do that. But a president can easily do that. I want you to tell him this. Take this message. Go. Okay, then what the ambassador says is what you're saying. He's speaking for you. Jesus, in the Gospels, forgives sins. The people say, who can forgive sins but God alone? But the authors of Mark and Matthew are not telling you here that Jesus is God. They are telling you that he has been authorized by God to forgive sins. Other passages tell us that Jesus will do the end times judging of human beings. Well, doesn't that mean he's God himself? No, but it means he's very special indeed because God has delegated him the authority and presumably the power to do that rightly. Jesus, once in a while, speaks words that seemingly only God could say. How can he speak on behalf of God? Well, have you ever heard of prophets? When they are prophesying, sometimes they are speaking first person. I'm going to do this. I'm judging that. I'm going to do this. I will save you, etc. And the I there, coming out of the prophet's mouth, refers to God who inspired him and sent him. So, such actions on Jesus' part as forgiving sins, as judging at the end of this age, and speaking on behalf of God, they do not imply having a divine nature, or being fully divine, or being God himself. Because... God can authorize a human to do what otherwise only God would have the right to do. And there's no reason at all to think that those actions that I mentioned would be undelegatable. Principle 36, God can empower a human to do what would otherwise be beyond the capacity of any created being. Now, I know this is a silly and crude argument, but there have been sometimes Christians who said that because Jesus did miracles, such as casting out demons, curing the sick, raising the dead, that therefore Jesus is God himself, or Jesus is fully divine, or he must not be a mere man, but must have a divine nature. But no, haven't you ever heard of Moses? Moses spoke God's law. How can a mere man do that? Well, that mere man is inspired, sent, commissioned, empowered by God to do that. It ain't hard. So, casting out demons, raising the dead, healing the sick, such actions do not imply having a divine nature, being fully divine, or being God himself. Also, as evidenced by the apostles after Jesus' resurrection and ascension and the giving of the Spirit, Right, because they do all those things, and they, we think, don't have a divine nature. They're not fully divine. People like Peter and Paul, they're not God himself. Such actions do not imply having a divine nature, being fully divine, or being God himself. Principle 37. Any being which has died was not, at that time, immortal. That's just true by definition, right? 38. Any being which has died, is dying, will die, or might possibly die, is not essentially immortal. If you're essentially immortal, in principle, you can't fail to be immortal. Now, the New Testament says that God is immortal. Do you think that he ever attained that status? Do you think he could ever lose that status? 
I think it implies that God is essentially immortal. I give an argument for that in one of the episodes, which I'll link in the blog post for this episode. But even if you're not sure if the New Testament says that God is essentially immortal, I mean, look, doesn't perfect being theology tell you that? If God is the greatest possible being, he would not only have to be immortal, not subject to death, but he would have to be such that he couldn't lose that status, right? Okay, but once upon a time, Jesus was killed, and he really died. So at that time, he was not immortal. Now, people who believe in the New Testament think that now he has been rewarded with immortality. Now that he's been raised from the dead, he's now immortal, but he wasn't back then. And so because he at one time lacked immortality, he's not essentially immortal. Okay, well then, he's not God, right? And he's not divine in the same sense that God is. Being perfect requires being essentially immortal. We know that Jesus is not essentially immortal because at one time he was not immortal and actually died. Okay, so God can't die. Jesus died. We're talking about two beings here, people. And by the way, the New Testament never says that God loved you so much that he came and died for you as a man. But it does say that God loved you so much that he sent his son, his human son, to die for you. 39. This is an invalid argument. X is F. Y is F. Therefore, X just is Y and vice versa. That is, X and Y are numerically the same. This is self-evident. Really, no sensible person denies it. F here is just some quality that applies to both, some property shared by each. So the Father is called God, and arguably, in a small handful of passages, the Son is called God. But it doesn't follow that the Father just is the Son. Why? Because different beings can be called by a title, such as God. Maybe F is being truly called Savior. God, the Father, is truly called our Savior. The Son, Jesus, is truly called our Savior. Therefore, the one just is the other. Nope, that doesn't follow. That's an invalid argument. Because different beings can have the same title applied to them. Even a title like Alpha and Omega. The quality F could be being worthy of worship. So if Father is worthy of worship and the Son is worthy of worship, therefore the Father just is the Son. The Son just is the Father. They're numerically one. No, that doesn't follow. I mean, why can't there be two objects of worship? Say, well, only God can be worshipped. Well, yeah, that's the Old Testament, but the New Testament pretty clearly teaches that after his exaltation, the Son should be worshipped. And that brings us to our final point, 40. One can honor or dishonor someone indirectly by honoring or dishonoring their agent. Look at Philippians 2. After it talks about Jesus' humble obedience and then his exaltation as a reward, his receiving the name above all names, then every knee has to bow to Jesus, and this is to the glory of God the Father. What that means is that in worshiping Jesus, you're indirectly worshiping God, the one who rewarded and exalted him. So in the New Testament, one way to worship God is by worshiping the Son of God. And this assumes that these are two objects of worship. This idea of directly honoring someone by honoring someone else, right? You're honoring both of them. And so you're worshiping both of them. And by worshiping the first, you're also worshiping the second. Of course, you could also worship the second directly. Okay, but if the Father and the Son in the New Testament are two objects of worship, because it's explicit that you can honor the one by honoring the other, if we're talking two objects of worship, as we talked about last time, only selves are appropriate objects of worship. So if there are two objects of worship, there are two selves here. And if there are two selves here, there are two different beings here, because a self just is a certain kind of being. Different selves, different beings. Well, that's a lot of truths. This episode and last, we've gone through 40 truths that I claim are self-evident, that is, things that any normal human can know, so long as their judgment is not distorted by some kind of non-rational factor, and so long as they've had some kind of appropriate experience. 
Do you think all of these are true? Why or why not? And do you think it's right that all of these are self-evident? Are these really things that can be known, not on the basis of other things, but just sort of by reflection? Like when it occurs to you to wonder about these things, you just find yourself automatically forming the belief that they're true and a strong conviction that they're true. If so, these are kind of like stakes in the ground. You bring these to the texts. They help you interpret the texts. They help you separate plausible from implausible readings of the texts. It looks like Trinity and Incarnation theory shouldn't be just a free-for-all where any speculation is something that should be equally considered with any other. Some speculations fit the text and others really misfit the text. And also, some speculations seem to be in line with God-given reason and some seem to fly in its face. We don't want to be against human reason, right? This is a gift of God. This is arguably the greatest gift that God has given the human race. It's not the very greatest one. It's way up there, right? Let us know what you think in the comments section on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. That's episode 223. Or if you like, let us know what you think in the Facebook group for the Trinities podcast. This week's thinking music has been the track Ruffling Feathers by Jesse Spillane. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can listen to or download that entire track. Before we go, I'd like to make sure I thank people who've been donating to the Trinity's podcast recently via PayPal. That still does work. I've kind of been trying to switch to Patreon, partly in case I ever go down to like three episodes a month instead of every single week. But obviously, any support is much appreciated. So I'd like to send out my thanks to Rebecca, to David, to the Georges family, to Joshua, to Rashid, to Aaron, to Gary, Stephen, and Edmund. Thank you so much. Your support is encouraging and helps with the ongoing costs of producing and hosting the Trinity's podcast. You can find PayPal links on the right side of blog posts, and you can find our Patreon page at patreon.com slash trinities. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with friends on Facebook, Twitter, or Pinterest. Thanks for listening. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.